All right, it's showtime. Hi, folks. As you know, our topic today is reviewing your portfolio. And I must say that this is one of my favorite topics because it's uh, my belief that most people struggle when making decisions related to their portfolio due to information overload that leads to a tough time determining what is best for them. Let's face it, too, most people don't have the time or the energy to fully educate themselves at the level necessary to make most of the decisions for themselves. With that said, it's for the same reasons that most people have a hard time choosing or committing to a financial advisor, too. In fact, we feel that as a financial advisory firm, if you can't somehow separate yourself from the pack in terms of how and why you do the things that you do and how you can bring value to a client, then there really isn't any reason that people should listen or want to work for you, work, work with you. So when I personally hear most of the advertisements on TV, the radio or online from most of the big financial advisory firms, they all kind of sound the same to me. Uh, so when I see or hear them, the first thing I, that I think to myself is, I guess the only reason that uh, they get so much business is because that, they saw, that, that they're a household name, not because uh, they somehow said something or convinced people that they were different or that they could bring them a value that other firms can't. That's why our two goals for this webinar today are first, to educate you on the fundamentals as it relates to reviewing your financial portfolio and investing in general. And secondly, to discuss some of the most important investing philosophies that we have as a firm that we think separate us from the pack when it comes to this topic and what we do with our kind. But before we do that, I want to thank each of you for joining us today to discuss this extremely important topic. My name is Brian Dockerty of PLC Financial Solutions. I'm your host for this workshop. Now, unfortunately, my beautiful, wonderful partner in business and life, Rachel Dockerty, who was usually our moderator for all our webinars, can't be with us today due to a prior business commitment. So I'll be handling all the comments and questions as we move along. Unfortunately, you're stuck with me today. But before we get started, let's take care of some general housekeeping first. If the screen is not big enough for you to read, you can click on the view options drop down at the top right of your screen to make it larger. All you have to do is click on the screen first and then you'll see it up top. Also, you'll see that there are two boxes at the bottom of your screen. One's called chat, it's for your comments, and the other is called Q&A for your questions. Please use them accordingly and I will respond to them in kind once we come to a break for me to do so. Now, I'm not sure, well, I'm actually, I'm pretty sure that many of you guys are going to have questions related to this material as we cover, that we're going to cover today. But since we have a good bit to cover and only an hour to cover it, I'm going to ask you to put them in those boxes below. We can even email them to me at info at plcfs.com if that's easier for you. And at the end, we will be staying for some extra time to cover as many of them as possible. However, if we don't cover yours, we'd be happy to answer it by either email or either a 15-minute Q&A phone call scheduled for another time. I have posted links for you to schedule that at, uh, in the chat box if you're so inclined to do so. Next thing, this webinar is being recorded and it will be sent to everyone who is attending today. So don't worry about missing anything. You'll have plenty of time to check it out again at your convenience. Also, because we want to make sure that you're all paying attention, and because we'd like to have some uh, fun, we'd like you to have some fun as well. Before we answer any questions, we have a six-question quiz for you at the end. 
And the first person to answer each question correctly inside the Q&A box will win a $10 gift card to a store of your choice for each question you answer. So make sure you have a notebook handy to jot down some brief, some brief notes related to some very special bullet points that I will point out as we go along. Finally, my obligation as a financial advisor and a fiduciary to inform you of our RIA's disclaimer statement. And that is that our investment advisory services are offered through Fusion Capital Management, an SEC registered investment advisor. And we only transact business in states where we are properly registered or are excluded or exempted from registration requirements. Also, SEC registration is not an endorsement of our firm by the commission and does, not, and does not mean that our advisors have attained a specific level of skill or ability. And most importantly, all investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. So now that we got that out of the way, I have one for you as usual. What math, what math class does a tree with a speech disorder take? Twigonometry. <laughs> That's a new one. And I looked it up myself. I didn't even steal it from the kids. Found it on the internet yesterday. All right, as usual, I'll keep my day job. Okay, so let's get started with the basics. So how do you define what a personal portfolio is? This is actually pretty easy. It's quite simple. The collection of whatever your financial assets are at any given time, such as stocks, bonds, cash, cash equivalent, or even alternative investments like Bitcoin, or although I don't want to invest in that, got a little bit of it, uh, Bitcoin, real estate, gold, etc. you name it. If you've invested in it, it's part of your portfolio. However, today, though, we are going to discuss mainly the traditional investments in a financial portfolio like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETF, which stands for exchange traded funds, and cash and cash equivalents. So when it comes to these types of investments, you generally want to mix these types of investments within your financial portfolio to balance growth and risk. How you do this is by creating a balance of the certain types of investments in different proportions. These different types of investments are referred to as asset classes, and they generally come in four main classifications. Bullet point one, bullet point one, getting started already. Get them handy dandy notebooks out, and you can jot this down. The first Asset class is called equities. That's anything based on stocks. The next is called fixed income, which is most commonly attained through both owning uh, government and corporate bonds of all types. Third is cash and cash equivalents. And the fourth one is real estate. It's really kind of two, real estate and commodities. Now, when you balance these different asset classifications in different proportions, it's called asset allocation. Asset allocation. And this is what creates a risk reward profile for your portfolio, which is determined by the risk tolerance that either you or your situation bears. Now, as we go along today, we'll break down the building blocks related to these things in order to in order for you to kind of wrap your head around each of these concepts. So why do I even need a financial portfolio anyway? This is actually a really good question, which I get from time to time, actually. And the simple answer is that, uh, well, uh, in that a well-invested financial portfolio can help grow capital for future use in a somewhat predictable way. Of course, there are no guarantees when it comes to investing. However, the long history of the financial markets can be very helpful at providing insight as, as how markets have performed over the long run, and thus can give you 
the perspective you need to feel more comfortable about investing long-term in a financial portfolio. So even though there's always risk involved when it comes to investing, since the goal is to fund the future of yourself and possibly even your children or to a certain degree for generations to come, creating a financial portfolio for the long run is probably the safest and most predictable way to achieve these things. Plus, since we all would like to, or may have to retire someday, having a financial portfolio and plan to do so has historically proven to be the most prudent approach to reaching that outcome. So both creating and understanding your financial portfolio is paramount when it comes to meeting your financial goals. Okay, now you know the basics uh, the basic makeup of most financial portfolios. Let's talk now a little bit about diversification. Having a diversified portfolio allows you to spread capital across more than just one investment category. Bullet point two, bullet point two. Come on now, write this down. Bullet point two. Now, diversification, write that down, diversification into multiple asset classes will help to protect capital in the event one or more asset categories does not perform well at any given time. Essentially, diversification is a technique used to reduce risk. The goal is to maximize return by investing in different areas that would each react differently to the same market-based event. Diversification is considered by many to be the most important component of reaching long-range financial goals while minimizing risk. There are two main types of risk when investing, non-diversifiable and diversifiable risk. Let's dig into them a little. Now, non-diversifiable risk is associated with every company. This type of risk is also known as systematic risk or market risk. So factors include things like inflation rates, recessions, exchange rates, political instability, natural disasters, terrorist attacks, war, and even interest rates. This type of risk cannot be eliminated through diversification, though it can be hedged against. And then there's diversifiable or unsystematic risk. That can be reduced through diversification. You can invest in different companies, different industries, different markets, different economies, and even different countries to mitigate your risks. This is what's known as having unsystematic risk because none of these are dependent on the same systems for their success. Thus, this form of risk can be reduced simply through portfolio diversification. Now, here are a few other types of unsystematic risk that exist. Things like a company were to incur. Things like new competitors or regulatory changes or a shift in management or a product recall. These things would be specific to a single company or industry and could cause one investment or group of investments to incur losses, but not an entire diversified portfolio like would happen if there was a worldwide crisis like our current pandemic or that, that we just went through. Like it caused in March of 2020. And that is a non-diversifiable non event, which causes all asset classes to lose value at the same time. Sometimes they call it a black swan event. Uh, on that note, let's discuss market risks a little more. 
<laughs> bullet point three. Man, we're jumping into bullet point three already. Come on now, write this down. There are four main types of market risk. The first is interest rate risk. And that is the risk that investment value will change due to a change in the absolute level of interest rates. This type of risk affects the value of bonds more directly than stocks. In fact, we just went through this over the last year. As interest rates rise, bond prices fall and vice versa. This type of risk has actually been extremely relevant for investors over the last year or so because inflation got so out of control after the COVID pandemic, the Federal Reserve Board, otherwise known as the Fed, found it necessary to raise the Fed fund rate extensively, which then caused the bond market to correct more than it ever really actually has in this short period of time in its full history. The next is called monetary risk. The first one was called interest rate risk. The second one's called monetary risk, very closely related to interest rate risk. Monetary policy impacts interest rates through regulatory um, committee decisions that determine the size and rate of growth of the money supply. This can and has gone hand in hand with the interest rate risk because it is the Fed that controls our monetary policy in the US. And thus their main tool for controlling the monetary policy is by raising or lowering the Fed fund rate, interest rate. The third risk, market risk, is commodity price risk. And commodity price risk impacts raw material input, input such as cotton, corn, wheat, oil, sugar, soybeans, copper, aluminum, and even steel. This type of risk not only impacts the raw material, but commodity users as well. For example, as the price of steel rises, this increases the cost of automobile production and can negatively impact the producer's profit margin. Political and regulatory changes, seasonal variations, weather, technology, and market conditions can all impact commodity prices. And the final type of market risk is called currency risk or exchange rate risk. And that is when the price of one currency in relation to another goes up or down. Assets or business operations across national borders are exposed to currency risk. This type of risk can be reduced by hedging, which offsets currency fluctuations. I'm not gonna really get into that when it comes to this today. However, you can imagine that if you own an asset in a foreign land that has a value that can't be reliably transferred to US dollars at any given rate, then of course, currency values are going to affect your network at, at all times. So with all these different risk factors, market risk factors at hand, you should now understand why it's so important to diversify your investments. Another reason why it's so important. With that said, let's now take a look at how to diversify our investments through different asset classes. Get a sip here. It's drying up. All right. Asset classes are groups of similar types of investments. To have a diversified portfolio, you need to have a variety of asset class investments. For example, if you invest in all equity stocks, even among different companies, you are at a higher risk of loss because equity stocks will typically act the same. If one equity stock drops, you can expect others to drop in price as well, leaving you short on investment funds. The different class, then the different class types, equity stocks, by purchasing a stock, you actually own a piece of the company. 
Another class type of investment is a fixed income or debt or a bond. When you buy a bond, you are actually lending money to a company or a government for interest. Government bonds, other types of bonds and certificates of deposit, for example, they're all debt instruments. You're lending them that money. And then there's cash and cash equivalents. The money in your savings account, in your pocket, or hidden under your pillow. This is actually a promissory note from a government that they are holding for you a certain amount of value for you, which used to be gold. I'm not sure exactly what it is now, probably military strength. But that's what that cash is, stands for. And then there's real estate and commodities. Now, owning something physical like property, natural resource commodities, and precious metals like gold. Now, at different times in our history, these different asset classes contributed in different ways to an investor's portfolio. Currently, they do not all hold the same value in a portfolio that they once did. But the reason that many investors invest in them anyway is because they are all part of their own separate and independently functioning markets. So when one market is up, another can be down, flat, or up as well, maybe. Because these markets do not correlate with each other directly most of the time. Okay. So now let's look at each of these asset classes individually. Equity assets are commonly referred to as stocks or shares. And like I just mentioned, represent a share of ownership in a publicly traded company. Now, because equity assets are publicly traded and owned, its share price is published daily, providing transparency. The risks or potential drawbacks are one, prices are subject to large movements in stock market, in the stock market, because investors can experience large gains or losses at any given time, which is referred to as volatility. The higher the volatility of a stock or any asset, the higher its risk. This is why equities are considered the riskiest type of asset. Now, what are the benefits of equities? Well, one, they're produced, they've produced higher returns than most other asset classes over a long period of time. Typ typically seven years or longer is a reasonable time horizon for them. Also, many companies may pay dividends to shareholders, which can provide a steady source of income on top of the value of the stock. Finally, the longer you stay invested in equities, the less of a risk they are because once they're in a certain amount of gain above the principal investment, the chance of a loss of principal is reduced over time. All right, let's talk about fixed income assets, which is more commonly known as bonds. Now, purchasing a bond is a type of a loan. You are essentially lending money to an entity so it can raise funds to finance spending. When a government spends more on health, education, infrastructure, etc., than it receives in taxes, it needs to borrow the difference by issuing bonds. These are referred to as government bonds, sovereign bonds, or even gilts is another uh Another name for it. So what are the risks versus the benefits here? Well, the risks are, number one, the prices of bonds fall as interest rates on new bonds being sold rise, which causes anyone holding older, lower interest-bearing bonds to lose value on the asset if they desire to sell it because before its maturity. 
So, secondly, they also come with repayment or credit risk, which is the risk of a bond holder, usually a corporation, because, uh, but could be a government, depending on uh, what government issues the bond, not being able to repay when the bond matures if the company or government goes bankrupt. It's actually happened before. Smaller, uh, well, companies and um, governments. Now, what are the benefits? They're generally regarded as safer investment options as, as prices historically have moved less sharply than equities. They typically provide a high level of income plus medium to low to, to long-term capital appreciation with relatively lo low risk. They can be inflation linked in order to provide investors with some degree of protection against rising inflation. The US government actually sells what's called TIPS bonds, which stands for Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. They work by increasing the principle of the investment by whatever the CPI, Consumer Price Index, inflation rate for the year is. All right, now cash investments are a range of securities that typically take the form of short-term loans that pay regular interest. Repayment is usually less than one year. Generally, cash equivalents are associated with money market investment. I'm sure you've heard that term, money market investment. Most of, most of us have had a money market account at the bank. That's actually a cash equivalent associated with uh, money market investments. Because money and market investments, money market investments have a short maturity period, interest paid is generally lower than bonds. Although these days it's actually higher than most. It's one of the highest that we've seen in a long time. You can check in accounts that, can get, that are getting 5%. Now, asset managers hold a variety of money market securities for their diversification benefits. They're made up of various companies, banks and government borrowers with various maturities up to 12 months. Now, the benefit to cash uh, investments are they are shorter term investments where the money is easily accessible and generally very liquid. They offer better returns than interest paid on a bank uh, by a bank account, at times keeping up with inflation. These days, really, are getting very, uh, surpassing inflation right now. But not always. Most of the time over the last, uh, prior to the last year or so, they, they generally don't keep up with inflation. Now, money market unit trusts are also more flexible than a uh, term deposit offered by banks with no fixed waiting period before withdrawing your money. Again, more liquidity. They are among the lowest risk investments held by unit trust funds other than physical cash. Now, what are the risks? Since they yield such low returns and they, they have historically, they can cause an investor to incur an opportunity risk if they are too heavily invested in cash. They can fall behind inflation and thus cause an investor's portfolio to not keep up with inflation and thus lose value as it relates to the future value of money. All right. Now, when it comes to real estate, the real estate asset class, there can be actually a few different types of real estate investment approaches that are considered. The first, you can own property direct, uh, directly, either residentially or commercially. Most of us do. In this way, someone can either collect rent and capitalize on capital appreciation of the value of the home at the same time, or they can even just flip the property for the capital appreciation or the profit immediately. Second, you can invest in property development. 
thus build new properties for profit as a contractor or appreciation as an owner. Third, you can invest in real estate investment companies, which make profit from investing in companies that do one or both of those above things that we just talked about. So when it comes to real estate investment companies, a listed property refers to a property companies listed on a stock exchange. This asset class gives investors exposure to various types of property, including industrial, office, commercial, and residential space. A, a, a share in a listed property company is an equity investment subject to the rise or fall in its share price over time, just like on the stock market. The, recommend, the recommended investment horizon for this type of investment is five years or longer. Now, what is the risk for this type of investment? This asset class is associated with medium to high risk because of its medium to long-term capital and income growth. Many of these investments are illiquid due to property itself being illiquid, so you just can't get in and out of it quickly. And finally, the real estate market can be highly volatile due to it being so closely related to the banking and mortgage-based markets, which are highly sensitive to interest rates and mortgage-based investments. Lately, mortgage rates have been going up a lot, and that they're now anticipating the sale of homes to slow down a lot. But a big example of it was like in 2008, the Great Recession, which was caused by subprime mortgages that were bundled into mortgage-backed securities. Now, the benefits, real estate assets provide income in the form of regular shareholder distribution. Secondly, the, distri the distribution are distributions are usually more reliable over time based on rental incomes that rise over time. Third, listed property is considered a separate asset class to other equities because it offers characteristics of both equities and bonds. And finally, listed property stocks are less risky than other equities since their distributions are likely to be steadier. Now, now that you have a better understanding of what your portfolio is made up of and why, let's, let's discuss some of the different asset allocation choices that most investors have and why. Most financial portfolios have asset allocation choices based on each investor's personal risk tolerance. In order to accommodate large numbers of investors, every asset manager provides several investment portfolios that have different blended proportions of the asset classes that when together, create a specific risk level for the portfolio in advance. Bullet point five, boy, we're getting to the end, getting to the end of those bullet points. Only one more after this. What about those asset allocations? Well, they generally break down like this. First, you can have 100% fixed income which is 100% bonds in your portfolio. That's considered highly conservative. We could have 80% fixed income, 20% equities. That's considered conservative. You could have 60% fixed income and 40% equities. And that's considered moderately conservative. And then you could have 50% fixed income slash bonds and 50% equities, so I stock. That's considered moderate. You could have 40% fixed income slash bonds and 60% equity slash stock. And that's considered moderately aggressive. 
That historically was the most common portfolio that we would see when people were retired. They would retire at a 60-40 equities to fixed income. And they still do a lot of people. And then you can have a 20% fixed income, 80% equities uh, portfolio, and that's considered aggressive. You could also have a 100% equity portfolio makeup, and that's considered highly aggressive. They are pretty much the breakdowns of most people's portfolios today. Now, there are always some slight variations from these predetermined asset allocations. But these are the most standard combination that you'll see out there today. Also, the individual investments within these asset classes vary tremendously from one portfolio to the next and from one asset manager to the next as well. However, whichever investments that they use, they will usually fit into each fixed income slash bond or the equity slash stock asset classes. Also, there will usually be somewhere around 2% in cash or cash equivalents in order to keep some liquidity to be available for quick access to clients and portfolio and the portfolio's periodic expenses. So, now that you have a basic understanding of how most portfolios are constructed as it relates to risk, let's take a look at the different types of investment management strategies that are employed in order to pursue investment returns. Bullet point six, bullet point six, last one. Oh no, I'm sorry. This is that last one was bullet point four. This is bullet point five. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is bullet point five. The different types of investment managing strategies that are out there. There's four different main types. The first is what's called passive investing. Passive investing. It's also known as set it and forget it investment strategy. This is basically how most Vanguard and BlackRock portfolios work. Then there's active investing. And this is where asset managers make active choices on what to invest in and when. This causes investments in the portfolio to change periodically and maybe sometimes frequently. It usually does not change asset allocation in the portfolio, though. Trades are usually made within the current asset allocation makeup. So a manager, say you have a 60% equity, 40% fixed income or bond portfolio, they're going to actively trade uh, equities within that 60% margin and then they're going to actively trade fixed income investments within that 40 percent margin they're going to stay within the set asset allocation in uh, in active investing now tactical or what is also known as quantitative asset management let's just call it tactical for now asset management is executed through the use of algorithms that are fed market and or economic data metrics that trigger trades at predetermined thresholds. Now, these portfolios do not have static asset allocations to provide risk mitigation. Instead, they provide ranges of asset allocation. So a moderate portfolio, instead of being set at 50% equities and 50% fixed income, it will have a range of between 65% to even 0% equities at given times, and 35 to even 100% fixed income or even cash at other times, depending on how those uh, market and economic metrics are triggering the trading. 
That's called tactical asset management. And then the final one is what's known as protected or hedged investing. And that is where asset managers use various types of call and put options to both protect the principal invested and to generate income slash return on the assets invested. Now, the last two types of investing are the ones that our firm has been leaning towards over the last three or four years. Let's take a look at why that is. So let's try to tie all these things that we discussed into what, can, what, uh, what considerations you should look at most when it comes to reviewing your portfolio and what adjustments you may want to consider moving forward. I'm going to look at this first before we actually look at the tactical and the protected investment. And this is our bullet point six. Now, take that handy dandy notebook out because... Here are seven of these, seven of these uh, basic, this is a breakdown of the things that our, our firm thinks should be given priority based on today's financial markets and investment strategies and that, that are actually all available. So these are what I consult, um, I'm referring to as the seven considerations. And this is your bulletproof number six, bullet point number six. These are the seven considerations you should have when reviewing your portfolio. The first, current fixed income market yields. You want to find out what your fixed income is yielding and what the long-term outlook is for that yield. That's the first, the current fixed income market yields. The second is current equity market returns. Current equity market returns is a big deal. You want to know what they are and what the long-term outlook is for them. Third, what your portfolio return needs and goals are. So you should have figured out within your financial plan how much your portfolio needs to gain in return as a minimum. Most people are trying to get the maximum out. And of course, we all understand that. But really, it's most important that you get the minimum amount you need to sustain your plan. So you want to make sure that you know what that is. Fourth. The potential return of your portfolio's asset allocation. So if you're at a 50-50, 50% equities, 50% 50 fixed income, there's software that can tell you by today's standards, based on how the market is in the equities and the fixed income markets, what your particular blend of equities in fixed income investments have a potential to yield. If you're in a 40% fixed income or 60% fixed income, 40% equities portfolio, and it only has the potential to yield like 4%, and you your, your income needs in the future are based on like 5%, then they're not aligned. Now, no one can guarantee either, but you want to make sure that your portfolio at least has the potential to yield as a minimum what your needs are. The fifth consideration, the risk, what your portfolio's risk reward profile is and how it relates to your minimum return need. Like I just said, if you have a risk reward profile, I'm going to show you what that looks like in a minute, that doesn't align with to be able to create the kind of return that you need, then it's not aligning with what your minimum return needs are. 
So you want to know what your potential return is, and you want to know what the risk reward profile of your portfolio can yield. Six is how volatile is your portfolio? And you know that by looking at your risk reward profile. Now, finally, number seven is your portfolio's average return versus its compounded monetary return. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. So that's bullet point six. You want to write as many of them down as you can. So let's first look at the market-based factors for you to consider, starting with the current fixed income market yields and long-term outlook. Well, over the last five years, the average annual yield of a 10-year treasury note was 2.13%, although they were actually at 4.2% yesterday, and believe it or not, 425 the day before that. Over the last 10 years, the average has only been 2.03%. After looking at this pretty, uh, after you look at that, it's pretty obvious that bond yields were trending downward until recently. And this low yielding fixed income bond market environment had really taken a toll on retirees and investors in general over the last 10 years, whose portfolios either were or should have been on the more conservative side of things. And thus lost return as a result of it, or because many of them have had to take, have had to take on more risk than most of us would consider optimal for people in retirement and sometimes suffered market losses due to that. On the upside of this though, it looks like fixed income slash bond returns are making a big comeback. And once the low yielding bonds that are still part of most people's portfolios right now mature, they should start to see better returns from more conservative investments in the not too distant future, depending on the types of bonds, funds, or maturities that they're invested in. Next, let's look at the equity markets and where they've been trending. Now, over the last 20 years, the average annual return was 9.07% adjusted for inflation. It was actually 6.46%. As compared to the last 30 years, as compared to the last 30 years, adding 10 years to that, going back, which was 10.72% and 8.29% respectively. Again, you can see that the long-term trend is downward. The 20 year is lower than the 30. Okay. So now let's look what the potential return over the next 20 years is for a $100,000 portfolio that is made up of 30% bonds, 70% equity, which is a conservative portfolio, moderately conservative. Now, equities take 30,000, multiply it by 6.4%, comes to 104,200. Add that to the 70,000 that actually ended up with a negative 0.58% after uh, adjusted for inflation. Over 20 years, that turned into 69.6 from 70,000 to 69.6 adjusted for inflation. With a total return of 74.6%, over the next 20 years. Total return for the total return were a 3.73% average compound interest after inflation as compared to what it would have been over the past 30 years, which is 4.52% average compound interest rate after inflation. That's a 0.8% percent or almost a one percent difference when it comes to return so folks you can all see where the trend is going these days when it comes to mark uh, market returns and that's downward 
Now, let's look at the factors to consider when, when it comes to your portfolio. To start, first, your portfolio return needs and goals need to be given serious consideration. When you or your financial advisor were creating your long-term financial plan, there had to be a determination of what the minimum portfolio return will need to be in order for you to reach your goals. So if it was determined that 5% or 6% was going to be needed in order to meet your needs long-term, then a portfolio would need to be constructed that has the potential to do that return. Of course, there's no guarantees, but the potential return must be aligned with your needs. For example, if someone has a half million dollars, their potential return need is going to be less than somebody who has $300,000. If they had the same bills, same expense levels. Now, this way, you're at least in the ballpark with your planning. This can be calculated in any number of ways. The easiest way would be to use an online financial calculator to assist you. Secondly, you'll need to find out what the potential return is for the asset allocation breakdown that your portfolio is made up of. This will tell you whether it is designed with the intent of helping you to meet your future goals or needs. If it is not, then you should consider reallocating it to be able to potentially meet them. The main issue with fixed income or static asset allocation today, I'm sorry, the main issue with fixed or static asset allocation today is that both equities and fixed income investments aren't returning as much as they used to long-term. And this is causing many investors to have to invest more aggressively than their situation can tolerate if there was a major correction in the market. Thus, the potential return of a 60% equity, 40% fixed income portfolio or less is likely not going to return enough. But if you increase the equity portion, it is likely to cause the portfolio to exceed your situation's risk tolerance level. So let's continue on the other major portfolio factors to consider. Okay. Let's discuss these portfolio factors. Number three and four that I mentioned on slide 15 of all the seven considerations. Number three and number four of those seven that I mentioned on that slide for you to consider when it comes to possible improvements is in factor three, an analysis of your portfolio's risk reward profile is something that you definitely will want to do. As you can see, portfolio one has a 95% right here. Portfolio one on the left has a 95% historical range of potential return in any given, in any six month period of between negative. 8.84% and positive 12.65%. That's your risk reward profile. That means that in any six month period, it has the potential gain of 1.6% for every 1% that is risk at risk. Conversely, portfolio two on the right has a potential to gain 2.35% for every 1% that is risk. Thus, they both had the potential to average around 4 to 5% annu annually as well. This means that portfolio two on the right has a better risk reward profile than portfolio one. 
This is an important consideration for any portfolio that is being reviewed. In my opinion, a good risk reward profile is for a portfolio to potentially gain anywhere between 1.75% and 2.5% for every 1% that it risks. Now, let's look at factor number four, which is determining how volatility, how volatile your portfolio is. These same portfolios serve as very good examples of portfolios that have similar potential average annual return, but demonstrate much different volatility potential. Again, since portfolio one has a wider range of volatility than portfolio two, it is of course the more volatile portfolio and is thus the less desirable of the two when it comes to this consideration. All right, now let us look at our final portfolio factor to consider when reviewing your portfolio for potential improvement. Okay, folks, the fifth and final factor for you to consider when reviewing your portfolio is to determine how its average simple numeric return compares to its compounded dollar or monetary return. What do I mean by this? Now, your first thought when it comes to this consideration might be, I didn't know that my portfolio's average numeric return could be different than its compounded dollar return. But in fact, it actually can be, and you can only really differentiate this by comparing the actual total dollars earned between two different portfolios that have the same average numeric return. Numeric meaning if they both do 5%, you actually have to check to see if they started at both the same amount of money and did 5%, do they both end up with the same amount of money? Also, the variable that causes this anomaly to occur is the difference in volatility between two different portfolios. Now, you can see this clearly when you compare the two wavy lines that are representing two different portfolios on the top graph here. The orange wavy line, which represents the more volatile portfolio, has a range of plus 25% and negative 15% in any given year. And the gray wavy line has a range of plus 15% and negative 5%. And even though they both average, have an average simple numeric return of 5% annual, the less volatile portfolio produces a 42.5% total return over eight years, which is actually a 5.3% compounded dollar return annual versus the other, which only produces a 27.4% total return, or actually a 3.4% annual compounded dollar return. When you look at the actual dollars return, folks, that is a difference of almost 2% annually. Thus, this is a very big deal over the long run. Also, the spreadsheet below, shows a numerical breakdown of how the two portfolios arrived at these different compounded returns. I created this spreadsheet just so I could actually see how this worked in dollars. And I must tell you that I completely was blown away when I realized this several years ago at this point. So at the end of the day, when you're reviewing your portfolio, making sure that it has a good risk reward profile that minimizes your portfolio's volatility is of utmost importance when it comes to maximizing your, port your portfolio's potential over uh, your portfolio's potential overall in the long run. Okay, now that you have a good idea of why it's so important for your portfolio to have a good risk reward profile with the goal of keeping its uh, volatility under control, you now know one of the main reasons why our firm has preferred and gravitated towards both the tactical and protected investing approaches over the traditional static asset allocation 
approach that has become traditional for many investors. The bottom line is that one of the main priorities when it comes to both tactical and protected managed portfolios is to minimize volatility, which in doing so also mitigates the risk of the portfolio drastically as well. They do this by using algorithms that are fed both economic and market-based data when it comes to tactical investing and various stock option strategies when it comes to protected them. Also, these types of investment methodologies have been in use at the institutional level for many years, but they've just become more accessible to the average investor through different third-party money managers, money managers over the last decade or so. So to wrap things up, let's take a closer look at how tactical investment strategies work and what is capable of when implemented into a portfolio. The concept of tactical investing is to build portfolios that have ranges of equity exposure at any given time. As you can see in this slide, each risk tolerance based portfolio has a range of equity exposure that is considered acceptable under normal market conditions and for recessionary market conditions. This means that each portfolio has a sliding scale of equity exposure that's considered acceptable for each. This does two things. It allows the portfolio to participate more in market rallies when the data feeding the algorithm is favorable to do so. And it allows the portfolio to reduce equity exposure when the data feeding the algorithm is unfavorable to do so. And thus, it's through this concept that market volatility is reduced. Actually, our preferred investment strategy when it comes to tactical investing is concerned actually combines both tactical and traditional slash passive, or what is referred to as strategic or static investing. This allows the best of both worlds because when it comes to portfolios that utilize purely tactical investing, sometimes the market moves so quickly upward that the delayed response from the portfolio can cause it to lose out on too much upside potential. Conversely, when it is exclusively traditional or passive, or in a passive portfolio, the market can fall too far down to where the portfolio experiences too much downside potential. In this case, the tactical part of the portfolio will limit the limit losses due to its shifting from higher risk investments to lower risk investments prior to the bottom falling out. Now, to be clear, our firm does not develop these portfolios or get involved in the creation of the algorithms that trigger the trades within them. We use a company called Redwood. They have the expertise to do this at a high level and have done so for many years now. However, we do make the determination of which risk tolerance based portfolio is right for each client. And we do this through a very thorough analysis and assessment of each client's portfolio and personal situation. All right, now let's look at how protected investing strategies help reduce volatility as well. All right, when it comes to protected investing, so you know, our firm does not execute this type of investing for our clients either. We work with another third party uh, money manager called Zega Financial, who does that for us. They do this type of investing exclusively and have the experience and expertise in this area of investing that is desirable for anyone who wants to do it successfully. However, we, as their financial advisors, do perform a full analysis of our clients' financial needs and risk tolerance so that we can determine which type of Zager portfolio is most suited for them. We then match them to it as well as execute the orders for that portfolio to be traded and implemented, as well as monitor its success over time. All of which, of course, are instrumental for the success of their overall plan. Now, with that said, since Sega has several portfolio models, uh, models that utilize several different stock option strategies, we, of course, can't look at them all today, but in order to give you a basic understanding of what they're like, Let's focus on two different examples at this, at this time. This model in this slide is called the Z-Big IRA model. 
It's called this because it was created to conform with the rules and regulations of the federal government that relate to what type of stock options can be utilized in an IRA. Now, the name ZBIG stands for Z Zega Buffered Index Growth. This model portfolio was created to use short duration, high yield corporate bond ETFs over a two year period to protect, to protect the principal of the portfolio and stop and stock options. It's not just corporate, uh, also um, government bonds ETFs as well, over a two year period to protect the principal for the, for the portfolio and stock options to capture as much as 65% of whatever positive returns the S&P 500 does in that time frame. So in this graph, the blue line represents the Zega portfolio and the orange line represents the S&P 500. Now you can see on the left side of this graph what happens to the Zega portfolio when the S&P 500 is in the negative. The Zega portfolio is being protected from any losses because 90% of the invested asset are invested in short duration treasuries and corporate bonds, which protect the principle of assets as long as they are held until bonds have matured, which in this case is no longer than uh, two years. However, on the right side of this graph, when the S&P realizes positive returns on the other, uh, positive returns, the other 10% of the portfolio is invested in stock options that will prov provide up to 65% of whatever the S&P 500 return is. This allows for an impactful return from a portfolio that is really risking very little at the same time. So folks, as you can see, this Zega portfolio model has a strategy in place through the, through the use of short duration bond ETFs and stock options to limit the downside of the portfolio while still providing ample opportunity for a decent amount of upside return if and when it occurs. Thus again, staying consistent with the idea of limiting the portfolio's volatility, just like the Redwood portfolios do. Now, this Zega model portfolio is market-based since it depends on the performance of bond ETFs and what the S&P 500 does in that two-year period for it to get its return. However, Zega does have another model portfolio that is considered an alternative investment that I would be remiss not to mention because it does not directly depend on the bond or stock markets to get its return and it has really delivered some pretty good returns since its inception, which makes it a very attractive model portfolio to consider as well. Let's take a look at that before we wrap things up. These Zega model portfolios are called the high post series. There is a conservative, moderate, and aggressive version of it. Of it. The word high post, H-I-P-O-S, is an acronym that stands for High Probability Option Strategy. And this one single graph represents the same concept that goes on in all three versions of this portfolio model. The only difference between them all is how often what they do occurs. So let's talk about what they do. This portfolio only sells option positions against the principal to generate its return. The principal either sits in cash or cash equivalents like short duration treasury bonds and waits to see if the income from the options that were sold will be fully realized or not. So in this slide, you can see the red and green line that is going up and down like a stock or ETF price that is riding in the market. But in fact, it's actually the value of the stock options that were sold going up and down with the market. Usually the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ that the stock options are sold against. Also the big purple half Easter egg looking line is connecting two different strike prices 
on the index that is used. In this case, it's the S&P 500. And those two points are giving us a range from top to bottom that the index price needs to stay between, especially the lower end, in order to form the income that was generated by the sale of the option to be fully realized. Also, since these types of stops, stock options have, expira have an expiration date on them, the index slash stock option needs to stay within that purple line up until it expires. Which is once, which is once a month for the conservative model, and more often for the others. As you can see, the way that Zega does this, there is a 95% probability curve that the income generated from the sale of the option will be fully realized. But if it's strike price, which is the price at the very lowest part of the purple line, is reached, then it's at that point where this strategy can start to lose money. However, there is only a 2.5% probability of this happening in any given time. There is also a 2.5% probability that it could go above the purple line at the top. And in that case, it could actually make more money. That all being said, the major difference between the three different level portfolios is that the hypos conservative only sells options once per month and that the hypos moderate and aggressive model portfolios will sell options multiple times a month. Moderate being on average twice per month and aggressive being three or more. And thus generating more risk and income slash return from these additional sales. With all that said, that this non-market correlating type of investing reali realizes its return at a completely different rate than any market correlated investment, which also serves to minimize the portfolio's volatility. In fact, the high post conservative model has averaged 7.87% annual return since its inception in November 2012 and has still never provided a negative annual return as of yet. Well, folks, that concludes the educational part of our workshop today. But before we jump into our six question quiz and our Q&A for it, I want to make a special offer to everyone that's attending here today. I want to offer everyone here on the webinar today a no obligation complimentary professional portfolio review. And I want to take a minute to actually explain a little bit about what that entails and what you can get out of it. So this is what it entails. First, there are two ways we can actually meet to do it. The first is online using Zoom, which is almost just like how we're doing this webinar, but instead we'll both be able to see and hear each other and it will be completely private. Or second, we can actually do it the old fashioned way and meet at our office in Fort Washington, even though I don't do it that much since the pandemic anymore. We're right off the turnpike on Office Center Drive. Second, it's a two-step process. We would meet to gather all the information that I'll need to do the review. And then second, we'll meet a second time to go over the results of it. Finally, what you can get out of this is a clear understanding of whether it would be worth it or not for you to integrate one of the low volatility investing strategies that we discussed today. Or, per or perhaps even some other recommended adjustments if they can benefit you with the uh, with your current portfolio. So if you'd like to take me up on this, no obligation complimenting professional portfolio review, you can just uh, you just need to go into the comment or chat box and click on the link that I put in there in the beginning uh, that says 60 minute meeting for you to do so. Uh, if you like, if, if, if you like, you can actually click on that link now, and then it'll pop up the window. You can get back to it later, so you have it. And you can even do it during our uh, six-question quiz if you if you if you weren't paying attention, or during the Q and A. And you can actually be, you'll be able to schedule it at your convenience because you'll have the screen open. 
Uh, and you can put, you can, uh, you have access to my calendar and you can make it whenever it works for you. All right. Also, if you have any questions that you would like answered before you book, you can also schedule a brief 15 minute Q&A phone call with me as well. I put a link in there for you to do that too. I posted that link in that, in that chat back too. Plus folks, I will be leaving this Zoom meeting open for a half hour after it ends today. Uh, so that if you would like extra time to be able to copy and paste any of the information that I posted in the comment boxes or Q&A box, you'll have plenty of time to do that afterwards. All right, that's it, folks. Let's jump into our six-question quiz and our Q&A session. All right. I have to open this. Uh, I have to open the uh, Q and A box. Anybody who wants to answer them, just jump in there. First question: Name one asset class that we discussed. One asset class. Equity. Good job, Patsy. All right, number two, what investment method is being used when someone invests in multiple asset classes to help protect capital in the event one or more asset categories does not perform well at any given time? What's that investment methodology called? Good job, you're on a roll, Patsy. Diversification. All right, number three. Name one form of market risk. There was four of them. Interest rate. Good job, Patsy, you're killing them. All right, number four is a 50% what risk level is a 50% equity, 50% fixed end income portfolio at? Aggressive or moderate? Good job, Patsy. All right, number five, name one of the four types of investment management strategies we discussed. One. Remember I said one was the way that uh, Vanguard does it? Yes, passive. Good job, Patsy. You're killing them. Come on, folks. Final question. Name one of the seven portfolio considerations that we discussed. Just one. Come on, Patsy, go for it. I'll give you a hint. Talked about when the market goes up and down a lot, what is that called? Yeah, portfolio needs to gain. Yeah, what, what does your what are your return needs? That's a good one, Patsy. You got all of them. Great job. Everybody's slacking. No one wants to get in on it. Good job, Patsy. All right, now we did get a couple questions in the, um, in the email. If anybody has any questions, uh, you can put that in the Q&A, but I'll start out by going through a couple that I got in the, um, actually got four of them in, the, uh, in my email. First one, are bonds still considered low risk investments? Well, that is a good question. You would not think so because long-term bonds had almost a 35% negative return last year. 
and they're supposed to be considered conservative. And banks that have been invested in 10 year treasuries have gone out of business last year. Everybody remembers that or earlier in the year. So yeah, uh, the answer is though that historically they are considered conservatives, but I wouldn't necessarily call them low risk when it comes to um, what their potential is. They're low risk based on what their history has been. And that's a bit of a difference. That's one of the reasons why I feel like it's so important to diversify your portfolio, even into non more non-correlating investments. All right, second question. Are ETFs and mutual funds lower risk than stocks? Well, technically they are because they're more diversified. And most risk scales would show them at a lower risk level than stocks, individual stocks. But I wouldn't call them low risk. They're in the, you know, they're in the moderately aggressive in all equity, in all equity ETF anyway, is still gonna be in the moderately aggressive area versus an aggressive area uh, for, or, or aggressive or, um, yeah, most aggressive for a stock. All right. Since bond and equity market returns have been trending downward, what do you think is a good way to counter that trend? Well, I think I made my uh, I think I made my argument for that during this um, uh, webinar. Really, any way, any type of uh, any type of investing that involves reducing volatility and that has less correlation with the bond and stock markets is, is probably going to be a good way to counter the, the uh, lower trending bond and equity markets going forward. You saw that the, the, uh, the less volatile uh, portfolio compared to the more volatile portfolio was yielding almost 2% more. All right, now final question. What do you think is the most important factor to consider when reviewing a portfolio? Well, of those seven considerations, I think the most important is to look at what that risk reward portfolio uh, profile is. That's gonna tell you how volatile the portfolio is. When we, one was like seven, negative 7.35, versus the other one being negative 0.3, somewhere in that three point something. Um, and so I'd say the risk reward profile is the most important of all the considerations. All right. Here, here I have the references I actually Tried to uh, put them in the at the chat box, but I don't know something I was with them. I wasn't able to copy and paste them. I could email them. Anybody's interested, though. All right, folks, that concludes our workshop for today. I just want to thank everyone who attended for being the type of people that care enough about themselves and their family to spend their precious time learning about this important topic. I truly commend you for that. Also, I wanted to remind you that if you have any questions related to this topic we covered today or our offer of the no obligation complimentary portfolio review, or if we did not answer your question in the comment box or, uh, or about anything else for that matter, and you would like to discuss it with me further, just click on one of the links that I posted in the, uh, and schedule it uh, in the chat box and schedule a time at your convenience. Well, that's all for tonight, folks. 
My name is Brian Doherty of PLC Financial Solutions, located in the Fort Washington, PA area. You can reach us at either 215-804-9708 by phone or at info at plcfs.com. Or to make it even easier, just go to our website at plcfs.com and all our information is always there. Also, please mark Tuesday, September 26, 2023 at 7 p.m. on your calendar for our next webinar. Remember, we do them on the last Tuesday of every month. Have an awesome end of your month and Labor Day and a great month of September. And we will see you next month. Good night, folks.